And finally, I heard it like off to my right, and I quickly like swung my handlebars and the light over, and I caught first the eyes glowing. So it was like very much like oh, these oh, forward-facing God, eyes. Man. I got the reflection, which was like an orangey yellow, very much like a cat. And the first thing I thought was like, these are forward-facing eyes. This is some type of predator. This is not a deer. What do you do when you come out as LGBTQ and love the outdoors? What do you do when you see the outdoor space ruled by older white cis men and desire a diverse community of outdoor lovers? Accept it, change it, create it. I am Justin Yoder, and this is LGBT Outdoors. Hey everyone, I am Justin Yoder. I'm Patrick Thompson. And I'm JC Wienten. And we want to thank you for tuning in to the LGBT Outdoors podcast. We have a great episode again for you this week, and I'm really excited for our guest. I think you're going to get a lot out of it, and it'll be um, an episode that um, you'll really enjoy. But before we get to our guest, How's it going with you guys? It's good. Things are just slowly warming up in, in between our storms here in Texas. We're about to get hit with some more stuff tomorrow morning. Um, but we had some tornadoes and stuff within the last couple of weeks in the area. It's been springtime in Texas. Crazy. <laughs> do you guys know that we always start this episode with the weather <laughs> yeah is that is that a sign that we're getting old that we're we're now our parents no we just start talking about yeah let's the talk the about our 401k <laughs> taxes <laughs> uh, out here in denver uh, 46 low <laughs> to the 52 high 52s and then by the time everybody uh, listens to this the weather's completely different and they're like what are they talking about that's not what the weather is like <laughs> well let's change so the topic. i do want to oh, say something okay, no no i do want to say something about the weather yesterday it snowed but the sun was out it was so weird because it was coming from like the cloud i guess where it's coming from it's like on one side of of like i guess the sky and and it's like sunny right like right above me so like i it's like the sun is shining but like the snow is blowing sideways it's colorado for we, you. well we had it uh thundering while sleeting like last week or the week yeah. before that was interesting too okay Enough about the weather because we are not our parents, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got to remember next episode, we're not talking about the weather at all. Um, hey, let's talk about LGBT Outdoor Fest. Um, sure. That sure. is going to be good. in September. It's going to be September 22nd through the 24th. This year, it's going to be at uh, Rainbow Ranch in Texas. Registration is open. And we have one of our instructors that's going to be um, our guest tonight. So I'm super excited about that. We're not going to talk all about Outdoor Fest, but um, at the end, we're going to hear a little bit about his workshop. But um, let's kick things off. Matt Bloomfield, welcome to the podcast. Hello, guys. How's it going? What's Thanks up? for joining us. We're glad to have you. Yeah, happy we finally got to put this together. I know it. Where are you at now? You are in Arizona, right? Yep, I'm down in Phoenix. Very cool. Well, let's kick things off by learning a little bit about you. So, who is Matt? Where'd you grow up? Where'd you, how'd you get involved in the outdoors? Some of that fun stuff. Uh, so, I grew up in the Midwest. I'm from Indiana. Um, grew up fairly outdoorsy. We didn't really like, do any hiking, being Indiana, of course. Um, but like any day of the week, we were pretty much outside playing um, in the tree in the garden somewhere like that so kind of always was outside as a kid and then i got my first taste of mountains in kind of the west when i was eight on like a family road trip out to colorado arizona new mexico um and that was like nice. really eye-opening for me as a kid kind of mind-blowing just seeing flat expanses all my life and cornfields and nothing up in the sky you know yeah <laughs> um <laughs> So that, that was a kind of a big a big thing for me and, and, and my siblings as well. And I think from that point on, we all kind of like had this amazing like, I don't know, fascination with like that type of different landscape. Um, so I had wanted to move out here for several years and it wasn't until I was 23 that I finally like made the jump. Um, school being kind of my excuse to make the move. 
So I moved out to Arizona to Flagstaff and uh, started my degree in geology at Northern Arizona University. Um, so I lived there uh, all through school, of course, and then for another four years after and uh, kind of worked for the university, um, which gave me a good opportunity to like have a lot of time off and explore the outdoors even more. I got into backpacking, mountain biking, um, kayaking, like anything I could possibly like find the time for. I was trying to do outside because that was I was finally out west. I was finally like happy doing what I enjoy. And that was really great. Um, and then eventually I became a hiking guide about two years ago. So now I lead tours throughout uh, Southwest National Parks. So Arizona and Utah primarily. So I do like the big five in Utah and then like Grand Canyon and Sedona down here in Arizona. That's awesome. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, do a little bit of landscape photography, uh, a little bit of product photography and um, what you call like adventure photography as well. Joey's trying to capture those landscapes I'm seeing on my trips. So that's kind of what keeps me busy. That's cool. Nice. What does one do with, um, when you study geology? As far as a career choice? Well, yeah, like I, I, my uh, ignorance is showing, but I, it's, it's a study of rocks. The study of rocks and earth systems, basically. So, I mean, you're looking at how planets form how you know volcanoes change the landscape and the rocks they produce you're looking at tectonic geology which is like the way the crust on the earth moves around and how that affects um, processes on earth so it's it's very wide scale it's more than just like identifying rocks gotcha yeah that's very cool, very cool. yeah i can relate to you though with uh, growing up in the midwest because i grew up in missouri so very much the cornfields and flatland yeah, and yeah. everything, but I went from one flat state to another flat state. So <laughs> I, okay. I didn't quite break free like you did. Uh, um, well, that's right. As long as you get out enough. Right, right, right. right. Definitely. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your coming out story and how the outdoors might have played uh, an effect on that? Yeah. Um, so it's fairly uh, different. So, um, since I moved to Arizona, I'm, I'll start at the beginning, actually. So growing up, I grew up in a very strict household. Um, parents are still very strict. I mean, we grew up Baptist, went to church every week. Um, that kind of put me in kind of a dark place for a while um, as far as coming out and accepting myself. So I spent quite a few years very, very depressed and to the point of being really suicidal um, throughout much of my teens for about nine years or so. So it really wasn't until I finally just accepted myself by the time I was about 21. Um, and that was a few years before I moved out West. And then once I finally did move out West is kind of the tipping point, I guess. I mean, I started to obviously accept myself before I moved out. And then once I did, I started, you know, being more open with other people. If I'd, you know, meet other people, meet friends or whatever, I would kind of tell them and be open about it. So it started out as just like, my friend group knew every people I worked with knew and it's been that way for several years. Um, but unfortunately there's always been like tension between myself and like trying to find the time to tell my family. So it wasn't until this past year that I actually finally was able to have the confidence to tell my oldest sister, which ended up going, you know, as good as I could have hoped, which is really amazing. Um, yeah. she's been really cool. great and really supportive. Um, I wasn't sure how she was going to take it. I mean, I kind of assumed everybody was going to take it pretty poorly, but she was my safest choice. And since then we've been talking a lot and she's been very supportive and wanting to understand. Um, Her brother-in-law was immediately supportive and saying how much he welcomes me and and my partner as well. So very much at the beginning stages of expanding um, and telling more of my family. So, I mean, most people do that, you know, much earlier on in life. Uh, I wish I probably would have, but I think the rest of it's coming. So just kind of working my way there. Yeah. Well, it's nice. It's, it's always like at whatever time is good with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, like I didn't realize even how much we had in similarities. Um, 
But like when I was hearing you talk, I was like, are, are you telling my story right now? <laughs> you, yeah, right, your yeah. story. <laughs> um, I came out later in life. I was like 29, um, which is a long uh, story to get to. But again, like you grew up in a very um, conservative religious household. My family was Mennonite. So um, there was okay. that. My dad grew up Amish, um, actually. Gotcha. So, um, but that's almost like a a step above as far as strictness and yeah patrick and i have been together 13 years and they still refuse to meet him um so um, um i doubt that they ever will come around um uh, but my bro- both my brothers have um we kind of disagree on yeah. it but they still treat him like family and and it's good to see them when we do so um it's a journey it's That's a process year. always um yep. but um I think that it's cool to be able to have the outdoors as an outlet going through this right. because there's so much that the outdoors can offer as far as um, mental health and physical health. And um, it's a good place oh, yeah, to, definitely. to be when coming out. <laughs> it's good. It's right. good to be in the outdoors when coming out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was definitely part of my processing too. Even when I lived in Indiana, like my main way to process through my emotions and get through it was just to go out running a lot. And that gave me like the mental clarity to kind of think through things. And then when I moved out here, I had even more options of like, you know, outdoor therapy. So it's been great. That's amazing. When you do your uh, tours, is that working with a company or do you do those on your own? Uh, it's working with a company. I work for Good Trip Adventures. Um, they're based out of Bozeman, but they have guides all over all over the Western Western States, as well as the East coast. Um, but their whole mission is to be very inclusive and, you know, um, they're very LGBT oriented as well. Uh, many of our guides are, um, they do belong somewhere in that spectrum. So they're a great company to work for and, uh, very open and accepting to everybody. I really enjoy them. That's awesome. Love it. How'd you, uh, how'd you get into photography? That kind of started after I moved here. So, I had been living here maybe six to eight months and, you know, already seeing some really amazing things. And I thought like, you know, I need to try to capture this the best way I possibly can because these places are truly mind blowing. and I want to share it with everybody. So that's kind of where I started. Um, got my first little camera. It was like a little Nikon one, like a little interchangeable lens camera. Um, and then taught myself from there and yeah, I've been going ever since. That's awesome. Yep. I mean, it's, it's like when you live in these beautiful places, you just, especially with like how, you know, social media, like you can really reach a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to know all these things where you live. It's such a great place to share a, a lot of like the adventures that we go on. So that's yeah, a great absolutely. outlet for sure. It was interesting to kind of get into it during the explosion of social media and sharing locations and kind of seeing the effect that had on things. And it's kind of shaped even what I photograph in a way. So it's interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. What's your, like, I know you do a lot of landscapes, which makes sense for where you, uh, where you are and where you go. Um, but what else do you enjoy photographing or is it, or is that pretty much it? Yeah, well, it's a mix of like landscapes and then predominantly like adventure photography. So kind of photographing my friends and my buddies along the way, uh, whether we're like canyoneering, rock climbing. So just getting people in that shot to give some sort of scale and kind of show really the and try to tell a story and show the adventure along the way. So that's another big part of my photography. Nice. Are you a Canon shooter or are you a Nikon shooter? Oh, neither. I'm actually Sony. Oh, is that oh, actually, you know what? Oh. Yeah, respect, respect. Because um, yeah. I'm a Canon shooter, but if okay. I knew how to, if I knew how to use an A7 series camera, I I probably would go. Mm. With that. But I've been it. shooting Canon for such more. a long time. I wish I knew Off actually one. more about Canon uh, cameras and how to. All use right, them. we'll trade. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll swap when we I, meet up and we'll we'll try shooting with each other's cameras awesome but yeah i mean sony i know for a fact are like the most advanced because they've mm-hmm. switched over to mirrorless like they're one of the right. first ones to get to go mirrorless so they've invested yeah. a lot oh and they can basically see in the dark 
Yes, yeah, yeah, the process, process. yeah the lower I don't know. performances. Uh, super exciting, Canyons yeah. are Canyon I is mean, right there though. They were they were a little bit late on jumping onto the mirrorless bandwagon, but once they did, yeah, like right. man, they're pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody's Excuse making us, listener as we movies. kind of geek out about cameras oh for a minute. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I love cameras. <laughs> well, I I'm not a photographer per se. I I mean I like to take photos too, but I I shoot mainly video and. Okay. I mean, my my Canon is good for my use, so I love it. But yeah. I think even for video, Sony, Sony is really out there. So, how do you feel about like portability with yours? Is yours a mirrorless? Uh, it is, but I actually I even carry mine with a battery grip. I don't mind that it's bulky. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Just because I take. But you're also the guy that goes hiking with like a thirty pound weighted vest on calling me out right now for my weird habits yes <laughs> i'm not applying any sort of value judgment jc hey it's it's a it's a little bit of a challenge it adds a little bit of a challenge yeah so one thing as photographers you have to accept that you'll never be an ultralight hiker because it's just not an option for you <laughs> <laughs> kidding yeah. what lenses are you primarily using something wide i'm assuming really just two at the moment because I'm trying to keep things as light as possible. So I have an 18 135 millimeter zoom lens, and then my other one's the other side of the spectrum, so 10 to 18. Nice. So, so that's like the zoom. Um, and that gets me pretty much everything I want to shoot. And then I have my, my camera on one strap on my left, and then I'll have like my other lens on the other side so I can just quickly swap. So it works out really nice. well. I don't have to like dig in my bag and stop a whole lot. So it's great. Makes it easy. That's awesome. Yep. And you know what? I actually, I don't mind carrying a lot of camera gear with me, even when I'm like around, right? Like just roaming around town. You know that when you're holding a really nice camera, when you go to a restaurant, they think you're some sort of influencer. <laughs> they, oh, yeah. they garnish your food like, oh, like oh, it's ready for crap. social media. Take notes because I have yeah, been I'll going be to uh, restaurants. Bro. With my camera and they're like, oh my God, are, can you tag us in your post? <laughs> sure, sure. Just make it look really good. <laughs> that sounds like a very JC that. thing to do. Here, I'm just going to walk into this restaurant, carry my camera outside of it. Yeah, I have like bag. a gimbal and like all the things. <laughs> <laughs> like, this nice geek, iPod. don't serve him. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Do you sell any Anyways. of your prints or your photos or do you, is it just kind of for social media? I do. I have an online store with all my landscape prints. Um, but the nice. goal is to like have some physical prints, um, getting into the print shop and churning out here in a minute so I can start selling those at like art fairs and stuff. So working on that. Yeah. I do photography as well. And one of the coolest things is to be able to see your photographs in print. Like we're living in such an era when everybody's just posting everything on social media, but it's like when you get to like see your photograph printed, especially as a big print, just yeah. like brings it to life and it's like this is so much more worth it than just uh, a simple instagram post and which are it's great to be able to post on instagram because obviously you get to share it with everybody that way but it's way different from seeing it on a little screen versus like a a huge print hanging yeah. up on the wall so that's exciting yep i agree i just recently did a really large print and had it done for my partner's mom and gave it to her for christmas but it's like a 46 by like 70 yeah. it's like massive Oh, and it was wow. so cool to actually like see it in print. That was the first time I've ever seen in person, like in print form. On it was like on a nice metal backing, and I was like, okay, I got to do. Uh huh. It's addictive, isn't it? Nice. Did you have it printed? Yeah. You said nice. metal backing. Was it printed on metal or was it painted? Printed on pa uh, photo paper. Printed on metal. Printed on metal. Yeah, yeah. Like yep. aluminum. Especially yeah, those yeah. landscapes. That, that just really makes the colors pop. It's so cool. Yeah, it really did. That's awesome. Yeah, I kind of experimented and got. A whole batch of them on different like materials so i could kind of figure out which ones i like best and which one look better yeah but yeah that was the best option i thought yeah especially for gifts that's awesome mm -hmm. tell us more about um other activities that you like i know you do some mountaineering as well right yeah um a little bit of peak bagging which if most people may not be familiar with it's kind of just completing a list of mountains it's kind of just an addiction more than anything i think <laughs> but okay um, trying to get on top of as many mountains as possible. Uh, a lot of people do like the Colorado 14ers kind of checking off those lists of like 58. And then other people do like the high point in every state. 
So it's kind of following that format typically. I kind of look at it more like I just want to experience the best of every mountain range. So I kind of want to get into all the accessible mountain ranges around here and in other states and just do as much good fun ones as I can. Um, so that's kind of peak bagging. I do a little bit of canyoneering as well, a uh, small amount of mountain biking. Um, that's one of those things I always feel like I don't do enough of. I'll get on my bike and be like, oh, this is rad. It's so amazing. Like I need to do this more often. And then it's like another four months <laughs> until I'm on my bike again. <laughs> Can you tell us, uh, especially our listeners that aren't familiar because we have, we have people that listen all over the world, but all over the U S too. What's the difference between, or if you will define both of them and kind of explain the difference between mountaineering and canyoneering. Oh, um, so mountaineering, you're, t you're doing essentially mountain summits and a lot of it will involve snow travel and like traditional mountaineering. So that happens a lot in more or less the Cascades, especially because glacial travel is a big part of mountaineering as well. Um, whereas you're also using ropes and climbing equipment often and doing higher class hiking. So usually class three, class four, and then class five, which is where you're getting into actual rope work and climbing. So that's kind of where mountaineering is. Canyoneering is sort of the opposite because instead of going up, you're going down. So that's rappelling into canyons, which is pretty easy and accessible out here in the Southwest, especially Southern Utah. There's a lot of really great slot canyons you can rappel into. Um, so that's just throwing your rope down. Uh, you have your harness on, your belay device, and you're kind of just sliding down that rope and then walking through the canyon to the next point where you have to do that. So it's considerably easier. How do you get out of a canyon once you rappel down? Typically, you just have to keep going. Um, some canyons will have an exit where you, it's possible to scramble out. A lot of slot canyons, the walls are just so sheer and so tall. Like, there's like no way for you to, to get out once you're in them. So safety is a very big thing with canyoneering. Um, a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, get swept away by flash floods in, in canyoneering because um, there is no escape. So... That's a big thing, especially I want to tell everybody just like if you're getting into canyoneering, the biggest thing you need to like pay attention to is the weather. Like even if there's a 10% chance in the rain shed or the uh, watershed for that drainage you're in, like don't go in that canyon. That's the, the biggest way you're going to stay safe. So I'm assuming too that another like because again, I'm in Texas, so we have totally different uh, activities, although I am game for trying anything once, um, but both of those are things that I haven't ever tried, but I'm assuming like the other big safety aspect of that is going with somebody. Right. Yep. Yeah. Canyoneering is something you should always have a partner with. Um, it's, uh, it's also very difficult to do on your own in general, but it's a huge safety issue to do on your own. So always have a partner with that. What are the, what are the, some key steps people could take if like, they're hearing this and they're like, or they end up going to your Instagram and seeing you doing canyoneering or mountaineering. And they're like, I want to get involved with that. What are some steps that people can take um, practical steps to be able to actually like start doing that? Cause obviously you don't want to just yeah. order like a harness and rope and uh, right. <laughs> run out to the first Canyon you can find and be like, here we go. <laughs> yeah. I think the smartest thing is to, um, hire a guide, a canyoneering guide and get on some type of canyoneering tour. There's a lot where they'll actually teach you all the different uh, rope techniques you need, um, as an intro, um, course. So that's by far the, probably the best way to do it. So you can get a really thorough, um, breakdown of what you need to do and how to perform canyoneering. Um, the other is just finding a friend who's going to be, uh, who's willing to be a mentor for you. So I was lucky enough to find that friend. Um, we had been talking back and forth on Instagram, just commenting on stories. And eventually I had mentioned something to him about, oh yeah, I've been wanting to do canyoneering. He's just like, Hey, let's, let's go do it. He just invited me out and he actually became my best friend after that. And we started canyoneering all the time and he taught, taught me everything I know pretty much. So that's the other option. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Yep. How often do you go or what's the best time? I mean, I, I might know the answer, but is, is there a, like, what's the best time of the year to, to, to yeah, do that? Yeah, they're kind of is. So. Of course, out here in the Southwest, you're contending with the weather quite a bit with like heat. Um, so generally for, I'd say like the stuff in Southern Utah, where most of the slot canyons in the canyoneering is, you're looking at like spring or fall. Okay. Um, a lot of people also do wet canyoneering, especially in California. 
So that's where you're actually going into a canyon that has flowing water. And that's like a kind wow. of a different season for that. You're probably still looking at maybe doing it in the summer as long as there's not monsoon storms. So there's, yeah, there's definitely a season for it. Yeah. That would terrify me thinking about doing that in, in California. Cause like California yeah. weather, like the last couple of years has seemed to be so unpredictable and so much rain, so right. much snow, just so such extremes. Yeah. 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 This coming season I've met, I bet will be very challenging for, for Canyon years out there, but you know, it's doable as long as you know the risks. How long did it take you to learn how to do it? Um, I would say maybe a year of doing it and maybe doing like, I don't know, 15 canyons or so before I kind of felt like, okay, this is making sense. I feel like I'm confident in what I'm doing. So it does take a while. You know, some people it'll click faster than others, of course. Um, but yeah, it just, it takes a lot of practice. That's for sure. If you're looking for high quality tents, sleeping bags, or backpacks at a price you can afford, we'll look no further. We're proud to partner with Sierra Designs, a leading provider of innovative outdoor gear. Outside of offering high quality premier outdoor apparel and gear, Sierra Designs supports game changing organizations like LGBT Outdoors. To learn more, visit their website, sierradesigns.com, and enter code LGBT Outdoors to receive 25% off your entire purchase. So I, I have a feeling like you have some really good stories as far as um, adventure or when things might not have gone right or, um, mm -hmm. you know, th those uh, those crazy times out there. You got any? Uh, yeah. That yeah would what, be good what's to like a. Yeah. Like what's like a good, a good learning experience? Um, I've I have one involving a mountain lion, actually. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so this was like maybe the second year that I was living out here in flag in Flagstaff and I was out mountain biking up on the peaks, like kind of the dry Lake Hills area, if anybody's familiar. And, uh, there was a closed trail up there and I was like, Oh, I really want to go down that trail. I should just, maybe I'll just go do it anyways. Obviously being a very stupid decision <laughs> already. Um, so I did it. I went down the trail, um, and quickly found out why it was closed. Uh, so this area was like burned, a few years ago. So there's a lot of like down trees and a lot of the trail was washed out as well. And, and like, especially around where the turns were. So I ended up having to carry my bike through over the, over the, the down trees through the sections that were washed out. And I ended up spending way longer out there than I should have been. Um, didn't prepare correctly either. I only had the spotlight on my handlebars, no headlamp. Um, so by the time I had actually reached the valley floor, I had like three miles to go back to the car and it was like on an incline. I was just like, so exhausted at this point that I was just like pushing my bike and I would hear rustling every once in a while. And I had this weird sense that like something was following me as well. And Ooh, oh my God, it would happen. I would kind of stop. And I was in the, you were in the dark right now. Total dark. Yeah. Just the like little crappy light on my handlebars. And I would hear it and I would stop. I would wait like five minutes. Nothing else would happen. And I would just like continue on. And it'd be like another, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I would hear like just something subtle again. This happened like maybe three times in the span of a half hour, 40 minutes. Um, and finally, I heard it like off to my right. And I quickly like swung my handlebars and the light over. And I caught first the eyes glowing. So it was like very much like oh, these oh, forward facing God. eyes. I got the reflection, which was like an orangey yellow, very much like a cat. And first thing I thought was like, these are forward facing eyes. This is some type of predator. This is not a deer. And then I could kind of make out the outline as well. And it was a good maybe 50 feet away from me in the, in the, in the bushes. And Jeez. we basically just had to stare down for like a solid minute. And at this point, like I knew what to do with bears. But I, I was not even confident like what to do with the mountain lion. So I put my bike in front of me for protection and we had our stare down. And then I was like, okay, nothing is happening. I got to like initiate something, I guess. So there's like a dead ponderosa tree right above me. And I just like jumped up, grabbed the dead limb and snapped it and like screamed as loud as I could at the same time, just to like make as much noise and ruckus as possible. And like, luckily it took off after that. So that was great. Wow. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, I still had to like 
bike the rest of the way and i was like trying so tired um but i kept expecting it to like be behind me again so i just like had my head on the swivel like that's a good motivation <laughs> to keep going oh, yeah it was it was good motivation. <laughs> but luckily it never came back so yeah that nice. was a frightening encounter well i mean hearing the story it's kind of crazy but like the fact that we're talking to you today yeah. <laughs> now that you survived good yeah so words of advice don't go down close trails they're close for a reason <laughs> <laughs> always have a headlamp or another light source maybe some other form of protection knife something would yeah. help <laughs> yeah what are your what are the key things that whenever you go out you always make sure you take these key things with you always a headlamp spare batteries for that headlamp um i usually carry a small pocket knife i have a um a Garmin in reach as well, like the mini one. So that's always on my bag as well. Um, so those are big things that I always have on me. Yeah. Nice. I keep hearing more and more about the Garmin in reach, which, you know, like usually where we're at, I, it's, it's not that big of a deal, um, to be able to have one or we're in groups already. Um, but once you get out there West, especially in the mountains and canyons and everything like those Garmin in reaches, um, truly life-saving. Yep, they really are. I hope I never have to use it. Can I can I ask what what it is? It's a satellite communication device. So you can like um, text people through it, but you can also just initiate an SOS. And that oh, goes directly okay. to Garmin. And then they send dispatch out to your direct location. Yeah, so especially if you don't have cell service. Yeah. Is that like a subscription-based thing? or you It is. You can choose oh, like different options. But once you buy the device, you still have to pay monthly to to keep the subscription it. going yeah but it's nice. you know it's a worthy investment yeah but we've talked about this a a, a couple times this particular product so garmin if you happen to be listening <laughs> oh <my Yeah>. <laughs> no. we're taking sponsors we're right now PR. partners yeah. no I'll just put air tags on all my friends as backpacks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're like what's this that. <laughs> well, that's an option just kidding oh, but yeah i'm sure it comes in handy i i've had friends mm-hmm. actually i think i think josh might have one one of our ambassadors he's like mm-hmm. all about all that he usually has something it's like great. right here even when like you expect to be back at a certain time and you tell somebody like hey i'm going to be back at like you know 6 p.m and you don't yeah. show up you don't have service and it's like okay at least i can text them through this and let them know like sure. everything's still okay i'm running late you know so it's a nice. good thing to have I would be terrified if I ran into like a mountain lion. I know it's like even in Colorado too, like there's like bobcats and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I had the comfort of knowing that like at the time in Arizona it had been like 20 years since anybody had been attacked by a mountain lion. But I think that's... Are they generally wow. like afraid of you or I, I don't, I don't know enough. Well, like, they like usually shit. like will stalk a person or an animal for a while before they like sizing them up basically and, and, before they'll do anything. Um, but I think generally you can make them afraid of you. I mean, yeah. yeah. It, it, the thing too about mountain lions, usually if or when they attack, you don't know that it's coming until they're basically on you because they're so quiet. Yeah. Mm. Um, right. So they're one oh, of the ones you. that I would much rather not be, <laughs> be attacked yeah. by. <laughs> um, there's right. been videos out recently over the last couple of years of, cats coming out onto the trail and like you know kicking at the dirt scraping at the dirt and stuff like that um which is more about um probably them having kittens nearby and them trying to protect Mm -hmm. like that but otherwise if it's like they're in predator mode hunting yeah it's it's rare that you know that they're there until they're on you right i always think i'd rather encounter a black bear because they're at least out here they're more easy to be frightened and like run away than I think a mountain lion would typically be. Yeah. What are some of the other wildlife that you have to be concerned about in Arizona, maybe Utah as well? Rattlesnakes. That's a big one. I I do not like them. (laughs) I've gotten so many times where I've come within like a foot of stepping on them just because if you go out, especially if you're out in like the evening when it's a little bit warmer, sometimes they'll come out on the trails and I've been like trail running and then like nearly step on them. And that's frightening. Since my heart skyrocketing. <laughs> yeah, I Just bet. Like run much yep. like break your own personal record. 
<laughs> after seeing no. him just like run so fast. <laughs> Have you been through but, yeah. like first aid training or training to know what to do if you are bit by a rattlesnake? I have. That's a that's a thing we all guides who work in the national parks have to go through. We have to do what's called a woofer, which is a wilderness first responder. So essentially, it gives you the medical training you need to um, treat whatever outdoor related you know accident illness before search and rescue gets there, and then they take care of them. Yeah. So yeah, it gives you like a broad general idea of what to do for a variety of common scenarios. Yeah. So. Let's educate our listeners a little bit on rattlesnakes and snake bites in general, because it used to be the two th- big things that back in the day, at least, it was like cutting it and sucking the venom out. And then it became, yeah. let's put a tourniquet on it, which also is no. not good. Um, no. And so like, let's kind of debunk that then and share people with people what, what the proper thing is to do if you do get bit by a venomous snake. Yeah, both those things are not recommended. You do not want to try to suck out the venom. You don't want to put a tourniquet on it. Um, you could essentially make that area worse mm-hmm. by just kind of concentrating the venom in that area and also killing off, you know, an appendage that doesn't need to be killed off by, you know, lots of blood flow. So with a rattlesnake bite, the first thing you want to do is just immediately head back for help and try to get to a hospital that has an anti-venom. That's really your best course of action. Um, shouldn't waste time with like trying to do anything with the wound itself. Just get out of there as much as fast as you can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just like you said, putting that tourniquet on it, just like concentrates the venom right in that one area and most likely going to lose probably a foot. Right. Yeah. Have you had any experiences where your first aid has come into, uh, come into play where you're glad you had it? I've been pretty fortunate. I had a couple instances guiding where I had clients with hyponatremia, which is where you consume too much water and not enough salts and your body essentially is over flooded with, you know, too much water. And it's very, the symptoms are very similar to like a heat stroke. Mm. Um, so the course of action for her was just to get fluids. Luckily we were in have a soup eye and there was a clinic up there at the village. So she was able to be taken there and she had to be put on IV fluids for the day. Um, so that was one of them. Luckily that was, somewhat an easy fix with help nearby. Um, I had another one that was early like heat exhaustion. Um, it was a man in the, also in Havasupai. Uh, we ended up getting a really late start and it was close to hundred degrees by the time we were hiking, um, the final like 2000 feet up the Canyon. he started getting really dizzy, um, really nauseous and really could not like, even really weak as well. Like he could barely even hike. Um, and this was actually, before I was even a guide, I was just like a porter. I was just there to like carry gear. So I had no idea what to do. And the guide was like miles behind with his wife. <sighs> so you know, I was like, well, I'm just going to do whatever I think is right. And I basically put him behind a boulder in the shade, um, got a bunch of uh, clothing wet and just kind of like put it on him to help cool him down as well. And got him to drink more water, gave him some salty snacks. And then I went up to the rim to like, get a horse from him from the native American guides. So got the horse luckily after some convincing considering I had no money to share or anything. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Led the horse back down and got him on the horse. Luckily he was doing much better by then. Um, And then got him back up to the room. So this uh, woofer training, is that uh, the, who is that provided through? There's several different providers. Um, Knowles is a really big one. They're the one um, I did my training with. Um, yeah, I can't think of the other ones off the top of my head, but there's quite a few to pick from. But it, it's accessible to the public. Yes, pretty much. There is a, a fee, of course. It's sure I, I paid like nine hundred dollars for the course, um, and then courses run anywhere from like six to nine days, I believe. So it is a commitment oh, wow. for sure. It took me a while to actually to actually do it because of that. This reason. is like a, a pretty I- intensive kind of thing. It's not just like an afternoon CPR class. This is. Right. There's like, there's like coursework, um, a lot of instructor led, um, seminar things like classroom style teaching. And then also a lot of, uh, scenarios where you practice. So you'll have your partners, like they're, you know, having symptoms, some type of illness and you have to like treat them and figure out what's going on. So that's a big part of the training as well. Gotcha. Do you have to, is it a one-time thing or do you have to take refresher training? Yeah, so you do the main one, and then after that, you have to recertify every two years. But it's like a shorter gotcha. course. 
course to recertify. Nice. Yeah. Nice. But yeah, it's worthwhile for anybody who wants to, you know, be more prepared in the outdoors, not just for guides. Yeah. I mean, anything to prepare yourself is is definitely worth it, I think, especially right. if you plan on being in the outdoors um, a lot. Never can be mm. too prepared for that. Um, right. The two states that you're doing the most in is Arizona and Utah. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Correct. Um, what, um, let's talk about if somebody was to travel to those states, like some of the things that you would recommend doing, maybe starting with Arizona since you're there. Um, somebody's going to go there. Maybe something that uh, most people wouldn't know or might not be a common thing, or it could be as well, but just things that as somebody that loves the outdoors, you're like, these are some things that, I would highly recommend you do. Um, yeah. So Arizona is really going to depend what season you go um, during the winter or this time of year, the desert is a prime location for, for going out and hiking. So down in Southern Arizona. So it's everything kind of from the central part of the state downwards. It's um, a lot warmer and usually in the winter we're experiencing highs in like the fifties to sometimes seventies. So it's a really great time to be down here. And my recommendation recommendations would be, to go down to um, Oregon Pipe National Monument, actually. That's a really great place, like close to the, the border with Mexico. Um, doesn't get a whole lot of visitation, but it's a really amazing place. Like the cactus are incredible. It's like a whole garden, especially this time of year. You have wildflowers blooming and it's just incredible out there. Nice. Uh, recommend that one. Chiricahua National Monument and the far southeastern corner of the state is also really amazing. So it's an area, it's a little bit higher elevation, it's a little bit colder, but um, it's kind of in the pine trees and there's all these amazing like stone pinnacles. Um, it's actually being considered to be a national park pretty soon, I think. Oh, very so cool. there's, there's nice. been talks about that. So it, it'll probably blow up soon, but now's the place to go or now's the time to go see that place. Yeah. Before, before it gets crowded cool. by becoming yeah. a new national park, which I'm all for national yeah. parks. Don't get me wrong there, but it's fun to uh, hit it before it gets too busy. Um, yeah, absolutely. what about Utah? I know there's, there's a lot of great parks, uh, um, in Utah, especially, but, um, what's, what's your favorite go-tos? That's so hard because they're all so different. Um, there's so many of them. Capitol reef is really underrated. I think so that one doesn't get quite as much visitation as the other four. Um, cause it's a little more isolated, but it's got the same rock layers as Zion. So it's, it's also like very gorgeous, a little more deserty, but there's such, so much amazing things you can do. And a lot of actually backcountry things um, you can access in uh, Capitol Reef as well. And you can link like kind of everything together. If you wanted to do a whole trip, you could start in like Moab, make your way down to Capitol Reef, then hit Bryce and then hit Zion. And that's like within a five hour stretch of driving. So you could you break that up into a couple days, few days and hit everything relatively quickly with short distance. I'm drawing a blank right now. Is it five or seven main parks in Utah? Five. Five. Yep. Yeah. We had um, one of our ambassadors for Denver, um, Kaylee and her girlfriend on um, an episode recently, and they shared about their trip. And I think they hit all five of them on, on their trip and mm -hmm. car camp the, the whole way through. It sounded like an incredible time. Yeah, they're all amazing. They all offer something special and different. So they're all worth hitting eventually. Yeah, definitely. I think we need to do some LGBT outdoor trips out to Arizona and uh, Arizona. Mm -hmm. Arizona and yep. Utah. <laughs> yep. I was just thinking that. That's amazing. We used to have an ambassador in um in Arizona. Um currently don't have one, but if anybody is in Arizona that is listening and interested, like head over to yeah. our website and apply because we would love to be able to get that chapter fired back up. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for such an outdoorsy like both states, like super outdoorsy. We have like no presence. I mean, I think we have, we still have yep. our Facebook groups up. Yep. Local Not chapter yet. Facebook groups are but, up and, and active, but we're looking for ambassadors in both those states. Yeah. yeah that'd be that'd awesome. Be awesome. Get that filled up. Yeah. Uh, JC is our ambassador program director. So um, uh, that would be a good time to make a pitch for anybody that's interested. Yeah. Hit me up. Let me know. Yeah. What does your <laughs> ambassador program entail for anybody who's listening? Uh, so all of our ambassadors, um, actually now a lot of our states would have more than one. Um, it's a volunteer position, uh, but you are 
pretty much the lead for your area. If like you're based out of Phoenix, then you would organize uh, different events. Uh, typically, the ambassadors host um, once every two months. So every other every other month they have an event, uh, but they can do more uh, as much as they want. Especially if there's tons of um, events, uh, a lot of options as far as like outdoor activities. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a fun way to kind of get uh, people gathered, and uh, it's a great way to meet people. Um, but yeah, we've had um, yeah, I remember now, Justin. We had an ambassador there. Um, I believe in the Phoenix area too, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and, uh, uh, our ambassadors usually do uh, a year commitment. Some go a lot longer than that. Um, one of our very first ones is still on board. So he's in what year three or four now um, mm -hmm. doing great. And uh, really they're an extension of our organization and our mission. Like our mission is to connect the LGBTQ community to the outdoors and to each other. And this is a great way to be able to do that right in communities across the country. So it's, it's been an amazing experience and um, we're always looking for people that are dedicated and uh, have the same passion for the outdoors as us to be able to help give people that experience. We want to get people outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, let's talk about LGBT Outdoor Fest for a little bit and see if we can get some people fired up about that because I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. This is what, guys? This oh is our, this will be our fourth one. This will be four. Four times. Wow. I, oh, yeah. I guess that's right. Uh, yeah. I missed the first one. Yeah. So we've done um, three in Texas and one in Colorado. Um, the next one, like I said earlier in the episode, uh, the next one is in Texas. It's going to be in September from the 22nd to the 24th at Rainbow Ranch. Um, and Matt's going to be one of our instructors. Mm -hmm. Share a little bit about. Uh, what your workshop will be on and I don't have to go into it deep because we obviously we want people to come into to come to it and take um, your workshop yeah. but share a little bit about what people can expect to learn Keep a little mystery yeah right <laughs> keep a little mystery yeah. so for my workshop my goal is really to teach people how to take better photos so i would love to go over just like composition techniques um how to how to uh, tell a story in an interesting way with photos I'm just kind of documenting your hike and your journey along the way. And uh, yeah, just give me little tips here and there. It'll probably be pretty uh, beginner to intermediate friendly. So if anybody's kind of just starting out with, uh, you know, kind of a bigger camera setup or even with with cell phones, really, um, this will be a good course to kind of teach them the skills they need to to take some better photos. That's awesome. I was going to ask about cell phones. Like, it's mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous how good cell phones are these days. Um, yeah. They really have. But um, but it's good that people can uh, come in with whatever gear they have, whether it's just a mm -hmm. phone or if they actually have a DSLR or mirrorless or whatever and be able to gain some um, knowledge and expertise from you. So we're excited to yeah. have you. Especially, especially with like framing composition. Like that's not really going to matter what type of setup you have. Like if you just do that one simple thing, it's going to make a huge difference in your photos. So you can do that with a cell phone or a, a bigger rig. So yeah, and everybody wants that epic shot for uh, Facebook or, or uh, Instagram, really. <laughs> right. But um, maybe we can turn some people into actual prints when <laughs> when they come to it as well. Because yeah, that'd be that's cool. <laughs> that's really fun, as we were talking about earlier as well. Um, some of the other workshops while while we're talking about it, just for our listeners to know, we're going to have workshops on nature, um, archery, outdoor fitness, which JC is going to be doing. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Uh, backpacking, Sweet. fishing 101, kayaking, um, and photography by you. And as we get more and more people to sign up, if we need to add more workshops, we'll be doing that so people can uh, keep an eye out on the web website um, under Outdoor Fest, LGBT Outdoor Fest, and the workshops to be able to see what's being added as we go along. But um, you can go over there and sign up as well. Guys, you have any other questions for Matt or Matt, you have anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we wrap it up? I think I, yeah. If you guys have any questions for me, yeah. how can they find you? Um, I am on Instagram at either my personal page and bloom 990 or my photography page, which is Arizona underscore adventurer. 
And that's the best way to find me. I'm not on uh, TikTok or anything like that, unfortunately, but yep. just Instagram more or less. Do you have a website as well? I do. Um, I have my prints on smugmug.arizonaadventure.com. A little bit long. And yeah, that's where you can find all that stuff. Cool. And uh, we'll be putting all this in the show notes as well. So if you forgot that, you can just scroll down and click away and go check out Matt's photography and, and all of that stuff, which is awesome. Yeah. Matt, thanks again for uh, being our guest today. We really, uh, really appreciate your time and your uh, your knowledge. And I hope that it inspires a lot of people to be able to get outdoors and maybe try something new. Yeah, absolutely. It's always my goal. Hope more people get inspired and, and get out there. So thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Good to meet you. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we hope that you really did pull something out of this and that you share the podcast with others. Also, be sure to rate our podcast and follow it wherever you listen. That helps us out a lot. And until next time, get out there. Thank you again for joining us this week. If you have a campfire conversation story you would like to share, please email it to us at info at lgbtoutdoors.com. Follow us on Instagram at LGBT Outdoors and join the community at facebook.com slash groups slash LGBT Outdoors. Become a partner by joining our Patreon where you'll gain access to monthly bonus stories and exclusive content. For more information on today's episode, check out the show notes. For information about LGBT Outdoors, LGBT Outdoor Fest, local chapters, or to sign up for our newsletter, visit lgbtoutdoors.com. And if you're enjoying the show, please rate, review, and follow wherever you listen to podcasts.